Good morning and welcome everybody. We hope you're um, awake and have lots of have brought lots of coffee this morning for our early session. Um, this is discipline group number 16, Home Spirometry Initiation, Documentation and Billing. My name is Laura Beth Rupsich. I'm a physician assistant at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Adult CF Center. And this is my co-moderator, Greg McClelland. Um, and we have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So just to give some quick background before we get started on the session, um, this was our session summary, but um, we, we all know that there's currently a lot of variability when it comes to home spirometry uptake among CF centers across the country. Uh, we have some centers that have fully incorporated it into their routine care and have started billing. And um, we also have some centers who aren't utilizing home spirometry at all and are finding it hard to incorporate it. And then we have probably a lot of centers that are somewhere in the middle and um, are trying to move forward with it. So um, today we hope to provide a practical and informative session on home spirometry and uh, starting a program and maintaining a program. Um, so we are hosting a, a panel of advanced practice uh, providers and respiratory therapists today who will be covering topics including the initial setup the ongoing management and billing of home spirometry at their centers. And they will also be sharing some of the challenges they encountered along the way and some of their successes. So uh, we hope you enjoy the session today. These are our objectives, which you can read on the screen or see in the app. And just a quick reminder about the Q&A. We've all been here for a day now, but um, in case you don't know, you can enter questions within uh, the NACFC app within the session. Go to the Q&A button and enter questions while the speakers are presenting, and we will try to get to those at the end. We will also take some verbal questions at the end of each presentation, So, uh, but we just ask that you speak up if uh, you choose to do that. And before we get started with our speakers, Greg is going to come up and share the results of our home spirometry survey. Great. Thank you. So if anyone's having trouble hearing, just give a raise because it's, it's funny with a mic where it is, especially when you're six foot six. So I'm Greg McClellan. I'm a physician assistant at Dell Children's in Austin. So again, thank you for coming out. Um, and like Laura Beth mentioned, we did a survey month. I imagine a number of you participated in, in that back in March. And at that time, you know, we're at a different point in the pandemic, but we just wanted to get a sense as we were preparing for this session, okay, what are centers actually doing, spirometry use, spirometry billing, and just kind of get a little sense. So we'll run through some of those things we learned briefly. So um, we had a good variety of people who participated from, as you can see, adult centers, pediatric centers, and then providers that were involved in both. We also had a pretty good uh, representation from various disciplines. We primarily promoted this through listservs. Um, APPs responded the most, as you can see, but then we have a good, nice variety of physicians, RTs, nurses, and then people, if they were center directors or coordinators, could click that as well. So that's why it doesn't add up to 100%. And then we have almost a bell curve here as far as the size of the centers, where the vast majority were at moderate size, but we had some small, some large, so that's nice. And then almost all the centers were incorporating home spirometry. It was about 89%, and there were about, I think it was 112 respondents um, over the couple weeks that this was open. So almost everyone was using spirometry to some degree at home. And so we wanted to know, how often are you asking your patients to do this? You can see, fairly common for monthly, quarterly, certainly most common when there was a need that would arise, people would go ahead and use it at those times, but there were other intervals as well. And then we wanted to understand, how are you using it? So you can see most people used it for telehealth. Sick calls, it's obviously helpful and important there as well. 
You can monitor how people were doing on their home IVs. And then in the questions, what we meant with there with interval, and we explained it a little bit further, was where you were using it for a specific purpose, to monitor for FEV1 decline, to just keep technique up so that if you did get sick or had a telehealth appointment, you'd be good and ready to know how to use both the app and the device. And then some people were bringing the spirometers into clinic to get a good sense of, okay, at home I'm blowing the 87, at clinic it's an 85 or that type of thing. And then if you did have a home spirometry program, we wanted to get a sense of who was the champion or point person for that. So by and large, it was respiratory therapists, but you can see there's a good number from other disciplines as well. And then I find this interesting, you know, at, remember it was 89% of people were using home spirometry, but it's only about a quarter that were billing for it. Um, so we asked on some of these no questions, did we drilled down a little bit. And so the biggest reasons why people weren't wanting to bill is they were worried about the cost to the patients. And then a lot of people just didn't know how, but expressed an interest in learning how. So that's one of our hopes for this morning, is that whether you decide to bill or not, you feel good about that decision. And then if you're interested in learning more about billing, hopefully by seeing what a couple centers have been through, you'll get a sense about how to approach it or what, what mistakes you can potentially navigate around. And then you'll get a sense of how people are actually being reimbursed with some percentages and things. So again, thank you for being here. We're gonna transition into our first speaker, who's Andy Reed. He's out of Riley Hospital for Children with IU Health. He's actually been there his whole career back since 1993, so we're similar age, Andy. Um, he was involved in the NICU, PICU, and in both ground and air um, critical care transport. But then for the last six years, he's been the airway clearance specialist for the CF Center there. So, Andy, unless you get a step on up, we'll get your slides pulled up here. Oops. Shortly we will. <laughs> All right, thanks for your patience. Thanks, Greg. So, uh, good morning. And, uh, I'm going to start out by saying that I was asked to build this presentation for NACFC. Uh, I kind of had mixed feelings. I wasn't sure what to say because our program's been going on for about two and a half years, so I had to think pretty far back about how we started. And uh, one of the things I was most proud of is the, um, the large amount of work that we put into it. It's a, it was a great deal of work to, um, to get it going, and we had to uh, make changes on the fly. We had some, some barriers and obstacles that we had to overcome. Uh, and my primary concern was, did we get a lot out of home spirometry? Were we using it appropriately? Did we educate our patients well enough? Um, and I was pretty happy when I looked at the numbers, how many uses we had, and what we had been able to do with, um, with our program. I have uh, no disclosures related to this presentation. Uh, what I will say is I'll talk about some of the different products and services that, we've, that we're using, and that's not um, an endorsement of those products or services. So what I'm going to um, talk about today are uh, home spirometry accuracy and adherence, how to select patients, enroll, and educate them. And I think those first two bullet points are important for uh, anyone that's not started their home spirometry program yet. Then the rest of the topics are our center's initial plan for using home spirometry, um, how our program evolved over the two and a half years that we've been doing this, uh, troubleshooting some of the barriers that existed for us as clinicians and respiratory therapists doing home testing and uh, the word billing which is about as much knowledge about billing as I have but uh, I'm very happy that there's going to be other presenters that talk exclusively about billing so it would be easy for me to say that uh, you know we had good correlation to lab spirometry that we had you know pretty good adherence but I did want to include some published data that kind of um, was, you know, real factual data, not just me saying, you know, we did, we did awesome. So this was uh, an evaluation of a home monitoring uh, program for follow-up after lung transplant. 
And this is a good study to include because it points us towards highly motivated patients that have a really good relationship with a care team, that um, spend a lot of time in contact with, uh, with their care team. It's a small study of only 10 patients, and what to me was the most amazing thing is that they asked their patients to do spirometry every day, and 80% of them, uh, especially initially, did that. They did it every single day, which is pretty amazing. And there was a high correlation between uh, lab spirometry and home spirometry. The uh, ATS standards for re repeatability are 150 cc's in the FEV1, plus or minus, and uh, their results matched that uh, repeatability requirement. Um, one thing to notice is that adherence did decrease with these patients over time. Only 10 patients, so if you lose one of them, you're going to lose a lot of adherence. Um, one patient was hospitalized with complications, and it's kind of like you get your new device, you get your new toy, you're going to use it all the time, and then after a while you, you feel good. It's one more thing to do, so you, you end up not, not using it as often as you're asked to. Um, but the patients really liked being able to, to keep track of their lung function. So these are some of the things that point us towards um, these are good things to have for our patients. So at a glance, our program, um, we're provided home spirometers to our patients um, at no charge. We never charged our patients for their home spirometers. We haven't charged our patients for um, the dashboard. And the home spirometers were provided by the CF Foundation and, and a company called Zephyr X, and the spirometer that we're using is the uh, MIR Spirobank Smart, which is a very small handheld device. Um, our orders were placed in six separate orders. So for us right there, that six separate orders is a little bit of a stumbling block because you had an order, the order went out to the patients, you started getting patients on board, and then we found out well, we were getting more, so we had to select more patients. We totaled 138 spirometers distributed to our patients, and those orders were placed from May of 2020 to September of 2021. So that's a really long period of time to be getting devices out, contacting patients, and doing education. Um, selecting and enrolling our patients. Uh, our CF doctors selected priority patients. We had a lot of meetings. Um, our center has 350, uh, give or take a few patients. So all of the doctors had patients that they wanted to have spirometers, and we looked at those. And uh, we considered priority patients, that's a big, you know, important sounding word, um, but it really runs the gamut of what different doctors wanted these spirometers for. I think our most popular category of priority patients were patients that never called in with, with symptoms, patients that never said they, they felt bad, they'd come to clinic and they'd be like, oh, I, I feel super good. They'd do PFTs and they would have terrible lung function. They'd be down 25%. So we thought it would be a good idea to keep track of their lung function. So that was an initial group of priority patients. Then on the exact opposite end of the scale for some doctors were patients that re, uh, reported a lot of symptoms. Uh, called often with sick calls, uh, had more advanced lung disease. So it does kind of sound like all the patients that might be in a typical CF center. So that was way more than the first uh, amount of spirometers that we had. And uh, our go-to decision maker was what barriers did these patients have that might um, prevent them from doing home spirometry. Um, technical barriers, old phones, uh, interrupted cell phone service, um, not returning our calls when we asked them if they wanted to be part of the program, um, not coming to clinic. These were all things that we viewed that um, for our initial patients might make them uh, candidates that wouldn't be able to do what we asked when it came to home spirometry. So the way that uh, the program is, was set up by, uh, by the foundation is the spirometers went directly to the patients when they were ordered. So part of the large amount of work that the RTs had to do is we had to contact the patients prior to the devices ever being sent out. And the reason that is is because you want to make sure they want to do it. And we did have a small number of patients that said, we don't, we're not interested. We don't want to do it. And you also have to remember that we're a pediatric center, so we have a patient that's going to use the device um, and an adult that's going to take care of the app um, and putting the information in and then having the patient use that. So we would uh, usually, almost everything was done by phone initially to get them to agree to participate. And um, then sometimes we asked a patient in, in clinic if it was uh, convenient if they had, were coming into clinic. So
So we kept uh, track of the delivery of the spirometers by tracking numbers when we knew that the spirometers had been delivered. We reached out to the patients again, and we provided um, education via phone calls primarily. We did educate a limited number of patients in clinic. Um, some of them we did by Zoom, FaceTime. Uh, my partner at the time and I got so proficient at walking patients through the setup on the, by, by phone, um, I did it a few times by, by driving. And that sounds funny, but that's one thing to consider when you're doing a lot of things by phone and when you're dealing with, uh, with patients that have busy lives. They might need setup um, outside of what your normal business hours are. So there were a lot of evening phone calls. A lot of this was during the pandemic. Um, so I was able to work from home some, but I also had to still go into the hospital. So some of this stuff was done after hours, and I think that you know, represented a significant time commitment for the people in, the, in our program that set up. And uh, we also mailed uh, the user guide that was provided with the, um, with the spirometers. It's about a 12 or 14 pages in details, whether it's an Android or an iPhone, um, how to set it up, how to download the app, how to put your demographic information in. So we did make a pretty comprehensive attempt to get as much information to the patients as possible. And it's also good to note that this did change a little bit over the, the year and a half that we, we set this up. So we're getting spirometers out there to our patients, and um, what were we going to do with them? And I was, it was nice to see the, uh, the data that, that Greg put up about what other centers were, were using them for, which was different than our initial plan, and that's kind of where we are now. Um, this, I felt, was a really good study to include because because it's about CF, it's about home, home monitoring with spirometry, and it was specifically to identify and treat uh, acute pulmonary exacerbations in an early intervention study. Um, and the main question was, does early intervention of pulmonary exacerbations slow the decline of lung function? It's a big study, uh, 267 patients, 14 different CF centers, and it went on for a year. So there's, there's a lot of uh, really good information in there. I'm not a big study guy. I don't like to read studies too much, but this one is actually a really good one because they had a good question and it was directly applicable to what we were doing in our center. Um, and another one of the things that we found is they had really good correlation between their home unit and the PFT lab equipment. Um, for anybody that's just starting out, there's a lot of different home units out there, but as long as they are um, like FDA approved, they use the GLI standards, they should provide quality results. A lot of that goes back to the education that you're going to provide to your patients because I think that's key into getting good um, results out of, these, out of these home spirometers. So um, what was not so good when we looked at this study is they asked their patients to do PFTs twice a week and adherence was only 18%. And doing it once a week was 50%. So 50% looks bad on paper, but when you're actually dealing with hundreds of patients that you're asking to do something extra in addition to their, their daily CF care, 50% is not too terrible. Um, and the one thing that they noted in the study is there wasn't a statistical difference between lung decline in the early intervention patients and the, the usual care arm. Patients that just came to clinic made sick calls. The um, early intervention arm, they would keep track of that. Patients would come in for acute visits more often. They would use uh, oral antibiotics more often, but there was no difference in the rate of their lung decline over a one-year span. I think that speaks more to how exacerbations are treated and not whether or not home spirometry is a good tool to, to aid in that. So our center's initial plan, and it's, it's all detailed in this, uh, this welcome letter that we sent out. Um, every patient got one of these. I can't thank our uh, social work department enough for mailing all these out. And um, this was just the one of the number of ways that we uh, asked our patients to you know, follow our plan. And our plan was, you get the spirometer, we educate you, you do a test, and then you do a test once a month. We didn't want to be super specific. We just said in the first week of the month, do a test, and we'll, we'll look at it, and we'll just kind of keep track, get a nice uh, baseline, and keep track of their lung function that way. We asked them to please call if they felt sick because we didn't want them to use the spirometer as a self-diagnosis tool. And um, we also used it for a lot of the things that were mentioned in, in Greg's uh, introduction, sick calls, telehealth visits, 
and um, hospital follow-ups if we didn't think we were going to see the patient very quickly after they were discharged, and uh, assessment of outpatient antibiotics that may result from those sick calls or sick visits. So the reality was um, throughout the, the waves, we had uh, trouble getting some patients to sign up for the dashboard, um, and we had to follow up on all those patients. They've gotten a device, they, they got their welcome letter, they got their user guide, but they're not on the dashboard. So a lot of phone calls, a lot of moving parts, and uh, it got to the point where you felt like some patients, you felt like you were hounding them because you've called them three times that week, they've not picked up the phone. Um, some patients were reluctant to use the spirometer. They don't like doing spirometry when they come to clinic. We're gonna be sick, uh, they're gonna put us in the hospital. Uh, we did have one patient in our initial wave of the most prime patients that we could pick that was like, I don't know why my mom signed up for this. I'm never going to use it. I can give it back to you if you want. And we're like, no, we don't want it back. We want you to keep that. And, and thanks for telling us, so we'll quit calling. And um, some patients had those, those technology issues. Some patients are not very tech-minded. Oh, I'm, though I'm sure they're really good at, at TikTok. They're not really good at downloading uh, spirometry apps. And then dealing with the pediatric center, you have the question of, should that app be on a 12-year-old's phone and not the adult's phone? And if it's on the adult phone, or is that at their primary caregiver? Are they gonna be able to coordinate? Is mom gonna be able to get the kid out of their room to, to do spirometry once a month? So those are issues I think are important, especially in pediatrics. I'm, I'm not an adult therapist. I'm not sure that it's really any easier with adults, um, but you do have a few more people that you have to deal with in a pediatric center. Kind of some good news was our, our first wave priority patients had really good adherence. Um, all but the one that said no thanks got on the dashboard and they all tested at least once. And um, adherence declined after that. We did have patients that didn't sign up and we had patients that uh, signed up but never did spirometry. We did get good data pools. We did have excellent correlation with our lab spirometry. So some of the troubleshooting items when it comes to dealing with uh, Bluetooth electronic devices, um, getting the app and the spirometer to sync together uh, could pose some problems in, in the initial versions of the app. There was some difficulty with that. Um, poor quality testing. Um, this is a big one in the pediatric world, especially as we got through subsequent waves of orders where we picked patients whose their primary barrier may have been, they're not good at doing PFTs. They're not good at doing them in clinic with a clinician, so they're really not good at doing them at home on their own. Um, some of our doctors had difficulty accessing the dashboard, um, and we wanted the doctors to start following their own patients, so there was less workload for RTs, so there was a lot of uh, coordinating with ZephyrX, trying to get IT to help our doctors to where they could get um, easy access to the dashboard. And then sometimes I get a call and they'd be, Andy, I, I cannot log in. I know my pass. I changed my password and I still can't get in. And then uh, sometimes we, uh, our patients would disable sharing either accidentally or when the app would update. Um, they'd have demographic errors. So when you'd go in and see that your patient with totally normal lung function now has an FEV1 of 50% because they made themselves seven feet tall instead of five feet tall. <laughs> So um, I can't stress enough that making sure your demographics are, are accurate is very important. Every time that I examine a test on the ZephyrX dashboard, the first thing I do is look and make sure that their demographics are correct and then check the raw data because if your FEV1% predicted is really low but your raw data is similar to their last clinic visit, then you know that there's probably something off in their, in their demographic data or the quality of their test. So I think this is my favorite slide from, um, from my presentation. And, and um, I'm a pulmonary function technician as well, so I spend a lot of time looking at flow volume curves. And when I go in and check those demographics, I do a lot of uh, rejecting of tests on the dashboard. Um, it's easy to tell a good test from a bad test. And this is probably um, the best one that I looked at that week. And um, if you didn't know what uh, platform that we used in the lab and what the ZephyrX dashboard looks like, you probably wouldn't be able to tell which one was lab spirometry and which one was the home unit. The, sh the shape of the curve is very similar. Um, the raw data is within 150 cc's of uh, acceptability for repeatability. Um, 
I did reject some of those patients' tests, but they had enough tests in their uh, in their their series that they had three that matched up really nicely. So um, this, I think, is confidence inspiring when you think we've got these very small handheld devices. They have to be cleaned and disinfected. Um, is the patient doing the test right? This this kind of shows you if you have access to the dashboard or a look at their loop that you can get a lot of um, information and be confident that you're getting um, good quality spirometry. So one of the things I thought about when uh, I was putting this presentation together is we, is I thought, man, we really changed our program. We started out with this plan, uh, didn't go so well, and we had to change it. And really the best thing that, that I took from it when I did all this looking back is about the only thing we did is we dropped the monthly testing requirement. A lot of patients were like, it's just one more thing to do. I'm on Trikafta, I feel great. Um, my FEV one's never been below 100. I've never been in the hospital. Why do I have to do this? I forget about it. Um, and we were calling them a lot. And you just kind of feel like, you know, I've called my patient eight times in the last six weeks, and they're probably getting tired of getting messages from me. Um, we didn't call them and tell them to stop testing every month. They weren't doing it. Um, we just felt like, um, we could continue on with the other part of our plan, which was sick visits, sick calls, uh, virtual visits during the pandemic, and then later on we still have patients doing virtual visits, hospital follow-ups and assessing any outpatient therapy, whether that's antibiotics or um, just increased airway clearance. And this really reduced our workload. Less phone calls. Um, we told the doctors not to worry about the dashboard, that we would check it multiple times a week and let them know if their patients were testing. and just streamlined it a little bit. And this provided much more efficient use for our spirometers. Um, this is my very sad billing slide. I just want you to guys know that you can bill for this. Um, I included some of those codes. There's lots of different codes. They can be, be combined. Um, I'm going a little long, so I'm not going to really talk about billing since we're going to have so much information on that later. So I think the conclusions that, uh, that I drew when I went back and looked at all this is that we had the best success with in-person education, helping them download the app, helping them sync the spirometer, putting their demographic information in for them with data that we had from their clinic visit. That provided the best results. Um, that these are time-intensive projects, that there's a lot of management of the patients, the dashboard, um, troubleshooting, so you're going to spend some time doing it correlate between your most recent lab results and in-person spirometry um, and remote spirometry. And it's really best used for what I call a purpose-driven event. There's something that's happened um, and we're responding to that and one of the tools that we're going to use is home spirometry. So there are the references for my studies and I think we have time for a few questions. That's our CF team, by the way, uh, looking at the eclipse. Thank you, Andy, and thanks for um, starting off uh, with uh, electronic questions. So our first one here is the two-part question. Did physicians find value in viewing the patient data on the dashboard? And then how did you overcome the reluctance of physicians to access the data? So we didn't have too much reluctance for the doctors to, uh, to look at the data. Um, one of the things we realized early on is that uh, as RTs, we're super busy and we're not nearly as busy as our physicians are. They're not just CF doctors. They have lots of other pulmonary clinics. Um, so we decided that we would just take that back and then when a patient tested, we would let them know. We would uh, print off the uh, study, scan it into our electronic medical records so the doctor could look at it and make an interpretation. So they really, really weren't reluctant. And some doctors would, would call and say that they had viewed you know, tests on the dashboard. And then, uh, I'm sorry, what was the other part? Did they find value? Yes, um, and one of the things that w we, um, use, we use it a lot. We still use home spirometry a lot, and I guarantee when I get back from conference, there'll be a couple of messages in my inbox asking if I can reach out to patients. And um, there's also, um, when we prepare for clinic, we look and see who has home spirometry. Uh, if there's something that needs attention, whether, whether they're sick or not, we'll let the physician know this is one of our patients that has a home spirometry. And, the, and usually, um, rather than reluctance, if they feel like their patient has um, signs and symptoms, it's going to get treated, then they want home spirometry results. Okay. Um, any verbal questions? Yes, there's, there's no mic, so you have to be as loud as me if you want to ask a right. question. Thank you. 
Um, I, we definitely didn't keep track of what were um, categorized as, as acceptable tests. We definitely, when we get on the dashboard, we look at the entire series and we reject tests that, that don't have good quality. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with experience and coaching of the patients. Some of our patients are eight or nine years old, so coaching in clinic is, is a big thing. So what we would do is if we saw poor quality testing that we knew that was not going to be usable, we would reach out because we're using the dashboard. When the in-app coaching feature became available, we tried to do, especially early on, a lot of in-app coaching. Before that feature was available, um, especially our early patients that we knew had a lot of technology, patient had a phone, parent had a phone, um, I would FaceTime a test. And we didn't have real-time results of the curve like we do with the in-app with, with the, you know, the in-app coaching, but we did have a good um, ability just to see the patient doing the test, which to me makes a big difference. So if we saw poor quality tests, we would definitely reach out to see if we could, we could improve those. Um, yes, Clement? And I think one of the things that um, definitely would have helped to improve patient confidence and their ability to do quality tests were having the spirometer, you having it, and then providing it to the patient, educating them, having them do a test in clinic right after they'd done a, a test on lab equipment um, to just give them the confidence that they could use that device and use it effectively because, I, you know, the one thing was those spirometers got sent out and then we did education, and some of the patients just, they couldn't use it because it's so different. Um, I had one say, you're not there. You're not there when I do this, which I was like, oh, that's nice. Um, but I think that that was, that was a difference maker. Um, the patients that brought theirs, they never signed up to the dashboard, but they brought their spirometer to clinic with them, and they were like, we were scared to download the app and use this. Um, we would educate them in clinic. We would have them do a test, and then they would, they would understand, and we had a better quality testing with patients that were educated in person. Okay. Thank you very much, Andy. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Okay. Our next uh, speakers are actually a pair. So they've both been at UA UNC for about 10 years. So we have Donna Enlow, is, um, has been there for 10 years, but has been in CF for nine. She's a CF uh, fibrosis clinical specialist. And then my co-moderator, Laura Beth Rupsix, is um, also um, going to be speaking as well because they work together. Uh, and she's been at UNC, like I said, for about a decade, but in the last five years in CF, both inpatient and outpatient. So thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. As Greg said, I'm Donna Enlow, the respiratory therapist at UNC, and Laura Beth and I will be presenting today the creation of our home spirometry program. We have no relationships to disclose. Today, we will describe the goals of our home spirometry project and review key components of the program. We will also review the current state of our program. It all began in the spring of 2020. The UNC Adult CF Center began to distribute home spirometers that were provided through the CF Foundation program. We believed this could be significant in the management of our patients, allowing them to monitor their results at home and use for outpatient management. 
Um, our clinic did experience issues due to a lack of a standardized program, and we did find educating the patients to be challenging. Due to these issues, it was decided a home spirometry project was needed. The goal of the project was to improve how spirometry utilization at our center was done. Uh, a partnership was formed between Laura Beth and myself. Our goals were to provide one-on-one -on -one education to all patients that had a home spirometer device. We also hope to incorporate home spirometry into the RT workflow. And lastly, we intended to provide monthly interpretation of the results. So our center has 333 adult CF patients. Of these, 285, or 86%, have a home spirometer. 274 of those devices are the MIR SpiroBank Smart Device, and then 11 patients have some other brands of home spirometers. Of the 274 with the MIR SpiroBank Smart Device, 265 of those patients have received one-on-one -on -one education to date. This is 97% of the patients. The remaining patients we have been unable to contact despite multiple attempts or their loss to follow up from clinic. So our program consists of four key components, education, support, applications, and billing. We will now discuss each component. So initially, we set up and completed education visits with every patient. These visits were in person, virtual, or by phone. During this visit, we review the most recent in-clinic FEV1. We also provide instructions for use of the device. We encourage monthly use, it is not required. We advise the patient to pick one day a month call it spirometer day, put it in their phone calendar, and have it be a recurring reminder. Many of our patients have stated they, they found this helpful. Um, we also discuss options for sharing their results with the patient. We inform the patient there may be a copay for sharing via the Zephyrex dashboard and that sharing is optional, not required. Lastly, we advise the patient to set up and use their device, if they haven't already, within 24 hours of their visit. An education note template was also created in EMR. This is our education note template. It lists all the points that we discussed during the visit with the patient including advising the patient to use the device three times the first week they start with it to help establish a baseline and get them used to using the device. We also discuss what to do if they experience a drop in FEV1 or if symptoms have occurred. Patient portal message templates or epic smart phrases for us was also developed. The templates are listed here. A message is sent prior to the education visit, whether in person, virtual, or by phone, reminding the patient to have the device on hand and that education will be provided. If there's no upcoming visit, a message is sent to set up a time slot for a phone visit. An educational handout was also uh, created. The handout is provided during in-person visits or we send it via the patient portal for virtual or phone visits. We feel this handout reinforces the education and allows the patient to ask questions and it will also become a reference for later use. It quickly became apparent that technical support would be necessary. Um, as Greg noted. That support is provided via the patient portal, by phone, or in person, or during virtual visits. We discuss what the issues are 
and work to resolve them. We also review technique and timing. A tip sheet was created that covers most common tech issues. Some of these include Bluetooth and location services issues, updating the app, battery changes, among other things. The tip sheet also includes a link to an instructional video. Many have found the instructional video to be very helpful. If the issues are still unresolved, we do refer our patients to a device support number, and this has also been successful in resolving issues. Next, we began several applications we hoped would assist with the program's acceptance and long-term success. Before all visits, virtual or in person, the patient receives a message through the patient portal advising them to use their home spirometer the morning of their visit. This message also offers support if needed. We feel using the device before a visit has many benefits. It allows the provider to compare the results to their in-clinic result and also helps to inspire confidence in the results from the home spirometer. It can also uncover technical or technique issues and allows us an opportunity to discuss this more in depth with the patient during that visit. Device malfunction may also be uncovered this way, and we can then assist the patient with um, obtaining a new device if we feel like that is the issue. Something we felt strongly about was incorporating home spirometry into the RT workflow. Home spirometry is now discussed in every annual assessment. We discuss the patient use of the device in depth. If they're not using the device, we discuss why not. Some of the reasons given are lack of time, anxiety about test results, and misplaced devices. Once we've worked through what the, the reason for not using the device is, we then try to find solutions. Some patients decide not to use the device. We assure them use is not mandatory. This is okay. And we let them know that we're here for support if later on they decide to use it. Lastly, we review when to use the device, encourage monthly use, before all clinic visits, and if they're not feeling well. We believe to be successful, reinforcement is key. We have also incorporated home spirometry into the nurse coordinator triage calls. The patient is asked to use the spirometer and either share or send the results via um, the patient portal. The results are then sent to the provider and the provider uses the results as part of the patient's treatment plan. In some cases, this has actually prevented hospitalizations or antibiotic use. Instead, airway clearance regimens were adjusted and asthmatic uh, symptoms were treated. In other cases, the results actually did prompt oral antibiotic use or a hospitalization. Now, Laura Beth will discuss our monthly monitoring of the home spirometer results. Thank you, Donna. So for our patients who have elected to share their results over the dashboard, um, we have from the beginning wanted to make sure we're reviewing those results and providing feedback. Also due to the cost of the dashboard, we wanted to create documentation that could be used later on for billing, which I will get to shortly. We created a process where at the end of each month, I go into the dashboard and I review any of the results um, that have shown up. I create an encounter in the chart and I use a note template that we created. It lists the number of tests in the last month, my interpretation of the most recent tests, the test quality, and their best clinic FEV1 in the last year. And also I copy and paste um, 
the test results and the flow volume loop that are shown in the Zephyr X dashboard. In addition, within that encounter, I will provide follow-up recommendations. So, for example, if their FEV1 is stable, then I will recommend to continue routine monthly monitoring. However, if there is a change uh, from their baseline, then I may recommend to repeat home testing within a shorter time frame, like one week or two weeks. Um, I may recommend a phone call from the nurse so they can triage them or with the respiratory therapist so that they can review their technique. Uh, or lastly, I may recommend a scheduled follow-up with their provider. I then send a portal message to the patient with their results and any of those recommendations that I have made. And finally, I send the results to their primary pulmonologist only if there's a change from their baseline. Um, so in our clinic, our, our patients are followed by individual providers. So if they're stable, I don't send them the results. Um, but if, if there is a decline, then I do. And also, if their provider had made a, a treatment plan with them, say, in clinic and was expecting that result, then I will also send it to them. This is the note template that I use in the patient's chart showing what all the factors that I just mentioned for the review and at the bottom that I reached out to them over the patient portal and any of the recommendations that I have made for them. And here obviously is the test, uh, uh, an example of the test results in the flow volume loop that I copy and paste from ZephyrX into the uh, note template. So regarding dashboard use and monthly sharing, we currently have a total of 112 patients who are active on the dashboard and who have shared their results with us at some point in time. Also, on average, we have about 25 patients who are uh, sharing their results with us per month. And to the right, you can see that we have been tracking uh, dashboard use uh, monthly, and you can see there's a little variability per month, but we really haven't noticed any specific patterns in terms of, you know, the summer or the school year or anything like that. We have additional patients who are not sharing their results with us over the dashboard. Uh, but instead, they have elected to take a snapshot of their results and share those with us through their patient portal, like I think many other centers are doing. And at this, up to this point, we have not been formally tracking those patients that aren't sharing their results over the dashboard, so unfortunately I'm not able to provide any specific numbers to that. But as Donna mentioned, from the beginning of this process, we have explained to patients that it's optional to share their results over the dashboard um, and have given them those, those, two alter those two options for sharing, and we feel like those are two good options for them. And it really, it really just comes down to patient preference. Finally, we'll move on to billing. So for the purposes of this talk, we don't have a ton of time to go into um, all of the billing details because we wanted to do a, a program overview. However, I wanted to provide an update that we recently started billing in the spring of this year. And that was um, after our contract with ZephyrX was finally approved through our institution. So it, there was a lot of uh, holdups with that. It took quite a long time for legal and all the different departments at our institution to approve the contract. And then also um, that was after our billing plan was confirmed with our coding and compliance department. And after the review of all the various um, home spirometry code or remote monitoring codes, our institution approved us to use CPT code 94016. So that's a professional fee for the uh, review and interpretation of results and it can only be billed once every 30 days. And as you can see here, it can be used by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional, and as an APP, I do fit the criteria as other qualified healthcare professional. 
Uh, we are aware that there are other codes that other centers are using for home spirometry billing at this time, but this is what our individual institution um, approved us to use. We have been working with our billing department in tracking the reimbursement on a monthly basis. And as a side note, as many of you may know that uh, tracking billing can take time because it has to be sent to the insurance and reviewed and this can sometimes take months to find out the result of that. However, through August of this year, which is what we were able to obtain for this presentation, 103 tests had been submitted for billing and 79 of those had been fully reimbursed, so that's 77%. And many of those are still in the appeals process currently, and overall our billing data is still being collected, and I will say this is a, a work in progress. The good news is that only a handful of patients have stopped sharing their results over the dashboard due to having a copay or their insurance not, not covering it, so that's good news. And then lastly, in terms of overall reimbursement amount, so far with billing, we've been able to cover the cost of the dashboard and generate some, some revenue. So in conclusion today, Donna and I hope to show that we feel we have created a successful home spirometry program. We have educated the majority of our patients with a device we have incorporated it into the respiratory therapy workflow and we provide support when needed. We have a framework for when patients should use it and how to monitor it. And lastly, we have a billing process in place. And while not every patient utilizes the device monthly or even at all, we, we, we still struggle with that. We have patients who are still not using it. We, we feel that we, they have it available to them and Donna and I are gonna continue to encourage it and to promote its use because we think it's, it's very useful and clinically significant for us. We feel that our partnership as an APP and respiratory therapist has been key to this effort, specifically our dedication to this program. It's taken a lot of work and our frequent reinforcement with patients and our clinicians and our team members has really been key to, to keeping it going. In terms of next steps, we are thinking about creating a formal algorithm for home spirometer use with pulmonary exacerbations. Like we said, we are have our nurse coordinators are asking for that data, but we aren't. We currently don't have a formal algorithm or process that we're following, and also that might help us to capture some of those patients that aren't sharing over the dashboard and that are taking the snapshot and sending it to us through their portal. And lastly, I'd like to mention that we have a poster on our project. It's number 64, so feel free to check it out in the poster gallery or in the app. And then lastly, um, there's going to be another home spirometry session after this, if you're not tired of it, <laughs> after all this is done, uh, workshop number 14. Um, and during that session, I will be sharing our patient and clinician satisfaction survey results, which we were collecting during our process. So um, hope to see you there. And thank you all so much for your time. And we will open it up for any questions. Great. So one question that came through is the reason they don't use the dashboard because they get charged? And I'll add it, or if not, are there other reasons? Sure. Good question. Um, so reasons they don't use the dashboard probably are mainly related to that um, potential of having a charge because pers personally, from the beginning of this project, Donna and I have just wanted to make all patients aware that that's a possibility, that it really depends on their insurance, that um, you know, hopefully if they did have a charge that it would be a small amount. But I think Don is at this point doing a lot of the education and she could speak further to that. Right. As I stated, it's part of every respiratory assessment. 
many, if not all, of my conversations with patients, home spirometry is included. And as Laura Beth said, we've always made sure that we let them know that once billing started, there was a possibility they could be charged for it. I will say since billing started, and I'm able to tell them a little more, I think we have had more patients opt out of the dashboard, like not they didn't start the dashboard for fear of, of having a charge. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a factor in why some decided to just upload it through the patient portal. Thank you. And then, um, I'll enjoy this to you, Donna. Who's responsible for providing, for providing the technical support and what hours were they available? Um, at our center, it's Laura Beth and myself that provides the technical support. Um, and it's usually during business hours, you know, when we're available. Um, they'll send us a MyChart message or leave us a voicemail. Or um, often before a clinic visit, some will let us know that they're having issues, which is great because we can have them bring the device and work with it there. Hands-on is always the best way. It's often a little more difficult by phone or even virtual visit. Um, the dashboard does have the real-time coaching, which I've only actually used just a few times, but that's also an option. So that's kind of how we do that. Gotcha. Yes. And then the question next is, uh, has anyone measured the amount of time per patient spent educating, training, and coaching patients on home spirometer use? <laughs> we haven't, <laughs> we but it's have. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine so. Yeah, it, it's, it is a lot of time. It's, it's, a, it's work. Um, I think anybody that's got a program, I believe they'll tell you the same thing. It is definitely work. I know a lot of my time, a lot of Laura Best time, it is devoted to this. But we firmly believed in the project and believed it was important and still do going forward. So it was worth it. Right, right. I remember our RT said sometimes she'd spend 45 minutes going through things on the call. So, I mean, it is a time intensive yeah, process for it is. sure. Um, so another timing question, any sense of how much time it takes to send the preclinic messages and phone calls, and how are you able to incorporate that into the workload that you already have? Right. So for myself, I always do clinic prep. I'm sure many of us do. So it just became a part of my clinic preparation. I go through every patient, see who has a home spirometer, which for us is almost everybody, uh, or a large majority of our patients, and I automatically, as I'm going through the clinic list, send out the, for us, it's a my chart message. I go ahead, I have a template already. I have a smart phrase for it. Uh, so I just go to their, um, their in, inpatient message and send it right then as I'm going through my clinic prep for that day's clinic. So, I mean, it adds some time to clinic prep, but I've done it so much now <laughs> that, that it, it's a lot quicker than it was in the beginning. So it's just a matter of finding out who has the home spirometer and sending the, the message with the smart phrase, which the smart phrase is key. I have a smart phrase for everything. <laughs> Good. Good time saver. Yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you both. I appreciate the fact that you did it together, and it's just a good example of what we do with CF and teamwork. Teamwork, yes. It was key. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to switch hats here, <laughs> back to moderator mode. Uh, so we've got, all right. So next we have um, Dabney Eidson coming up. Um, Dabney has been a respiratory therapist since 1996 and has been on the pediatric CF team at Augusta University for 16 years. She was also on the adult CF team for seven years. When not in clinic, she works inpatient staffing in the Children's Medical Center where she also does critical care, air, and ground transport. And she enjoys live music and hanging out with her husband and two boxer dogs during her downtime. Mm. Love to hear that. So uh, welcome, Dabney. And 
Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm also very happy to hear some of the same challenges that uh, Andy and Donna and Laura Beth have expressed. You know, it definitely there's comfort in knowing you're not the only one experiencing some of these challenges. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to navigate this bumpy road to try to get billing for home spirometry and the remote coaching, which, as we've well defined, is very time consuming. The experience I'm about to share with you is not the original story that I had intended when I accepted the invitation to speak with you today. Instead of success, I'm gonna share the process, which has really proven to be a little more difficult than our team originally anticipated. But it's my hope that there's still many lessons that can be learned from it. Oops, I'm gonna do this one. Yeah. Okay. I have no relationships to disclose. And our initial bumps, um, as this is going to be no news for any of you probably, that spirometry is an extremely technique-dependent maneuver, especially in children. Um, once the home spirometer started rolling out into patients' homes, you know, we were like, do your home spirometry a day or so before your clinic appointment. You know, we'll, we'll get the report. And we are using the dashboard. We, we definitely find that very helpful. Um, and we quickly learned that, you know, we really can't expect these parents to coach the kids on how to do these spirometry efforts correctly. You know, we have experienced RTs in the hospital that that is their sole job. They have training and experience in coaching children, and it's still a challenge for them many times. So it was really unrealistic for us to expect the parents to be able to successfully coach their kids. And we also learned very quickly that we can't expect the kids to know what to do either, even if they do it very well in the clinic. Um, as our other two speakers have talked about, you know, there's a distinct difference between using the spirometer at home. It can be glitchy. The technique is a little different compared to using the spirometer in, in the hospital. And you, you, before the in-app coaching was available, you, know, you didn't really have that person to coach you and guide you through it. So there was a lot of frustration. Um, and it is easily very time consuming, 30 minutes to 45 minutes for, for just one kid. Some of the things that might be a little more unique to our center and the challenges that we experienced is that we had a large amount of turnover in our pediatric PFT lab. Every single person who was trained and did well and you know, was very comfortable coaching children left our institution for one, way, one reason or another. Um, so that left a huge hole and a huge gap for us in our pediatric clinic. And that also meant that the adult PFT lab had to backfill into the pediatric PFT lab. And bless them, they were like, sure, we'll do it. Kids are no problem. We were like, okay, <laughs> let's see how this goes. But they did, were very positive. They, they jumped in with both feet and they tackled the problem. But fold in every other center's problems with the global pandemic, staffing shortages, realignment of staff, the halt in aerosol generating procedures meant our PFT lab staff was kind of left twiddling their thumbs. And so job realignment went to support the ICUs, whether they were comfortable actually working in the ICU or actually kind of being more supply and you know just kind of support for the ICU staff. Jobs were realigned. So really getting spirometry efforts for a successful clinic and accurate assessments was very difficult. So we formed a team. Oh, and to go back, um, because of these reasons, our director, when we started with, when the in-app coaching feature was available and we very well understood how time consuming it could be, our director was like, no, go fish. I don't have the people for this. If there's no reimbursement, if there's no billing, if there's no financial advantage to it, I'm not dedicating the staff and the resources for it. We have other issues to, prop, to tackle right now. So billing became very critical, um, a very important piece in trying to make this happen. So we formed a team and we partnered with a representative from what our hospital calls the Revenue Integrity Department, which is basically the billing department. 
Um, our pediatric CF program director was involved. I was involved as the pediatric CF respiratory therapist. And to be clear, in my job role, I am very educational. I actually don't do the PFTs with the children. I work very closely with the, P with the pediatric PFT lab, but I'm not the one in the rooms coaching them. I can help look at the, the reports and help gauge if it's an accurate report or you know, if it's a valid test or not. And I can help coach the kids in conjunction with the PFT lab, but I actually don't do the, the maneuvers themselves. We also involve the lead respiratory therapist from the pediatric, well, from the PFT lab. She's over both the, the peds and the adult lab. We had the Zephyr X rep involved on and off during various conversations. Of course, we tapped into the reimbursement guide that they offered. And then at one point, as recommended by the Zephyr X rep, we had conversations with a medical practice consultant's rep which is, was out of Utah at the time. So my impression, I was not in direct conversation with this person, but my, my impression was she was very innately educated and involved in medical billing. And we began to learn the lingo. I quickly realized that this is an entirely different world with its own language in the land of billing. Um, I had to learn what a CPT code meant. So CPT code stands for Current Procedural Terminology. And what it does is it provides a uniform language that payers and billers can talk for coding medical, surgical, or diagnostic services and procedures. And I've also learned that this tends to be for more the provider and the professional side of things. There's also the CDM code, which I was like, okay, what is that? So CDM start, stands for Charge Description Master or the Charge Master, which is the, the vehicle that hospitals use to actually bill payers. Um, CDM codes are very comprehensive lists of items that can be billed to either the patient or a payer. Think of it as like a bundle item. What they do with CDM codes is it includes the procedure, so it includes the CPT code, but it also includes charges for any supplies that are used, any devices, any drugs, and it's built to um, help compensate for the staff's time as well. So it's, it's really how a hospital makes money, whereas the CPT code is more how the professional makes money. It's basically a facility charge, so you have the two sides. You have the professional and then the facility. And we were aiming for this CDM code because we wanted justification for our PFT lab staff to be able to spend the time and the energy and the resources in making this remote coaching and home spirometry program work. So that's where we were focusing our efforts. And in March of 2021, we got an email. It was sent to 10 very important people the respiratory director, our CF center director, the director of, of revenue integrity or billing, the PFT lab leadership, the entire CF team. Balloons went up, confetti was thrown. We got the green light. We, and this was from the top. This was from our revenue integrity manager. She, we had the green light to finalize the charge capture for remote coaching of home spirometry that was specific to the hospital facility side. And within that charge capture, an order was incorporated through our EMR system. So whenever our providers would schedule the remote coaching session, an order was supposed to automatically drop. And we opted to use the CPT code 94015. That was the CPT code that was built within the CDM code. So our process at the time, during the second year of the pandemic, when we were still dealing with restricted aerosol generating procedures, was for routine spirometry, we would have the patient schedule an appointment with the PFT lab three to five days before their scheduled clinic appointment. And we would have the, the, the maneuver done, we would have the report downloaded in the Zephyr X dashboard. On the day of clinic, we would update the demographics with their current height and weight because before we were using the height and weight from their last clinic visit. So with, since this was in a week of the current visit, we would update that, print it out, and roll on. And we were so excited because we finally had this very vital piece of assessment, which that we didn't really have before. Zephyr reports were rolling in. We also opted to use this for sick follow-ups. We thought this was a great tool to have closer and more frequent monitoring of our patients without having them physically having to return to clinic. 
I, I'm very sure that our clinic is not unique in the fact that the majority of our patients drive a very long distance to come to their clinic appointments. We looked years ago, and statistically, it was over 75% of our patients have to drive at least two hours, many of them three and four hours, just to come to Augusta for their clinic appointments. So we thought this was a fabulous tool to try to keep closer track of their health, especially when they were sick, and keep them, you know, relieve that burden of having them physically come into clinic. Our process today, now that aerosol generating procedures are allowed, after April of 2022, once the Omicron variant started to settle down, we got clearance from our chief medical officer to resume PFTs as usual. So the actual numbers of remote coaching that we were doing died down. We did continue to use it for treatment and for sick follow-up on our FEV1 improvement algorithm. We define the patient's FEV1 baseline as the highest within a rolling year, and there's a couple exceptions to that. Um, like if they're hospitalized, that hospitalization will trump any other FEV1 that they had since a hospitalization resent, represents the ideal kind of form of health. You know, they're stuck with us. They've had quality airway clearance. They've had IV antibiotics. Nutrition is optimized. Um, so we use it for the sick follow-ups in comparison to their baseline, again, with the goal of trying to reduce in-person appointments and travel time. And we define sick as when the FEV1 is less than 5% down from this baseline. So at that point, we talk with the families, of course, figure out what's going on. We encourage increased airway clearance, step it up. If they're not doing it, do it, and then try to step it up to three or maybe even four times a day during the weekends. May, and inhaled, or not inhaled, but um, oral antibiotics may or may not be prescribed at that time. And then we say, based on what the plan is, after you're done, two to four weeks later, or after your antibiotics are finished, repeat your home spirometer. We'll schedule an appointment with the lab, and then we start, we make a note and look for it in the Zephyr X dashboard. At that point, if the FEV1 is not improved, then we may make some adjustments, and then we ask them to repeat it again. And then if it's still not improved, another two to four weeks or whatever later, then we'll bring the patient back in for the, an, in, an in-clinic appointment. Fast forward to the present time. I answered a survey on the <laughs> CF Respiratory Listserv regarding home spirometry. How are you using it? Are you using it? Are you billing for it? And I was like, yes, we are. I'm so proud. We created a team, multidisciplinary. We formed a process. We are billing. And so I get a lovely invitation from these two <laughs> to speak with you today on our process. So I do a deep dive and I contact the revenue integrity manager again, only not to, to, to not get an email, no, no response, no response, no response, which was baffling. So then I had to dig back through some of my emails and, and I started reaching out to some of the other members of the team that were from the billing department and got a couple answers and they weren't the ones that I wanted to hear. Um, when I followed up with them, they revealed that there were no charges that had been dropped. They were unable to track any of the reimbursement. There was no CDM code that had been placed. Zero, nothing, blank. So I was like, what do you mean, <laughs> blank? <laughs> what does this mean? So I was looking for information as how many patients had we billed? How many patients were we successfully getting some money back? If so, how much money? Did they notice any patterns between state and private insurers? There was none of that information. So we began using our QI process to try to tackle the problem. And one, the one thing that I learned is that when everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. <laughs> Everybody's doing this. So I began to learn that with so many working components, especially within a large organization like a hospital, that can actually be problematic. If there's a breakdown somewhere in the process, everybody's just kind of operating in their own routines and their own silos, and you really don't realize that there's a break, but everybody's just kind of carrying on as we always have. I started tracking the process and started talking to all of the parties involved, which if any of you have had any formalized training through the CF Foundation's quality improvement process, 
you'll remember that one of the number one essential components is to always involve your microsystems and keep the conversation going within your microsystems. So I started thinking of who all the people, who, who are all the players involved in this process? And I started with our revenue integrity billing team. And they said, well, we just thought you guys weren't doing remote coaching anymore. That's why we didn't see any of the codes. So it really didn't occur to us that there might be a problem. We thought, you know, the pandemic has settled down. You guys just weren't doing it. When I spoke to, which I knew we were doing it, I knew the PFT lab was billing for it. So then I turned to the admin lady in our RT department. She's the person that actually enters the charges into the charge master system. She said, oh yeah, I know that code. I get an error every time I use it. But I just, I just didn't think that was an issue. That's just the way it's always happened. I was like, you didn't think to speak up? You didn't think to ask about this? So when I asked her what the error code was, it was you cannot post charges to this patient encounter type. So more conversations later on, I learned that it was because we were registering the patient for the remote coaching appointment as a telehealth appointment but with the CDM code, we were trying to drop facility charges as if the patient was in-house. So right, in, right there was the disconnect. I also learned that that order that we had automatically incorporated into the EMR was not processing through. So the PFT lab was essentially performing these remote coaching sessions with no order. When I asked them about that, they said, Oh, well, we knew what to do. There's only one option that the Zephyr X offers, and that's the flow volume spirometry loop. So, you know, it's not a body box. It's not a pre-post. Like, we knew what they wanted. So then when I turned to our, the providers on our CF team and tried to ask about their process for what do they click when they want the patient referred for a remote coaching session, they said, well, we thought the order just auto-populated when the remote coaching session was scheduled. So again, we have these silos, people operating in their own routines and their own systems and not really realizing that there's disconnections along the way. The other thing is that when you, in medicine, you know, you place an order, you document that you did said order, and then you have the results. There was zero documentation anywhere in the medical record that the, the remote coaching was performed. I was working with the revenue integrity team and we were clicking through different patients' charts and they were like, I see zero evidence that this is done. Why are we trying to bill for something that wasn't even done? That's fraud. And I was like, no, 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 it was done. It was done, let's look at the medical record. Let's try to find that. We'll, we'll look for the actual report. And that was not even in a consistent place. We have a place in our EMR where if the patient is in-house, the report gets labeled with the patient's label, it gets interpreted, and it goes to medical records. But the Zephyr X dashboard reports were a little different. The PFT lab thought that the providers sent the report to medical records after interpretation was completed. The providers thought the PFT lab was sending the reports to medical records. And then in addition, there was a lot of conversations in phone notes and in the provider's notes regarding you know, Zephyr X results or you know, Zephyr X, the FEV1 remains down via remote home, via home spirometer, but there was just not a consistent place within the medical record that these, this was loaded. So the drive continues. We had lots of things to work out. Again, I tried to get in touch with this original, the OG manager that I worked with with the Revenue Integrity Department, but I learned that like so many others, she, during the pandemic, she took the option for early retirement. So that's why she wasn't answering my emails. That's why I had to try to turn to other people on the team that worked with us at the time. But those other people weren't as familiar with the process because they weren't the leaders of the project like the manager was. So I had to reconvene with a new team and start from scratch, essentially. And I had to keep the conversation going and the work moving forward. In August of this year, I received an email that said, Hi Dabney, after further review of the billing and coding information, we have found that we are not able to capture a facility charge for remote coaching. These services are only billable on the professional side. Please let us know if you have any questions. I have lots of questions. <laughs> lots and lots of questions. This particular team wasn't as eager to investigate the issue. They were just pretty much like, okay, Done deal, it's, we found our answer. 
But I was like, no, we had a CDM code generated before. There is something missing. The, your manager figured out a way to do a facility charge before. Like, what are we missing? These people weren't very happy with me. I was trying to be very nice, and, but I was persistent. And I'm sure they felt like I was questioning their judgment. But I felt like this needed further investigation. One of the questions that came up was, can respiratory therapists bill from the professional side? And nobody at our hospital really knew that answer. So I incorporated our professional agency, which is the American Association for Respiratory Care. I called them and asked them if they had somebody that I could speak to that was familiar with billing. And they, they do, they have a billing guru. And basically when her and I talked and um, I explained the process, she did, she was very complimentary that, that we were being persistent in this, but she said no, RTs cannot bill from the professional side. And when I told her how quickly our revenue, the new revenue integrity team was just wanting to drop the issue, she said, well, you have to understand, in a hospital system, this is going to be 0.0001% of a hospital's income. They are focused more on ICU charges, the bundle charges. That's where thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars are generated. That's where their focus is at. So that's why they're not really wanting to spend time and energy in figuring this out. So we have some smooth driving ahead. We've had some good, um, good you know, events. The meetings are continuing. The conversation is continuing. I have created a flow chart that when the FEV1 is down or whenever we want remote coaching, a referral goes to the pediatric PFT lab. The PFT lab looks for the order. If the order isn't there, then we talk with the providers and we got permission from the providers to do a verbal order if it's a last minute issue with the providers understanding that they definitely have to co-sign behind that. We also involve the clinical informatics team, which is our EMR people, to make sure that the order populated and what was the problem with it not populating to begin with. So we have the order. Then once the spirometry session is scheduled, labels are printed with that encounter because that was another issue is that a lot of the reports were getting labeled with some of the leftover labels from earlier clinic visits. So they would populate in the medical record under a different date. Um, so labels would be printed. The um, remote coaching session would be scheduled. And then once that was completed, the PFT lab staff would actually chart. They, we found a place in the medical record where they could chart home spirometry coaching completed. A message would be sent, oops, excuse me, a message would be sent in the portal to let the providers know, and then they could know to look in the dashboard and print it out. In addition, the PFT lab would print out the report, and we have a dedicated spot where they could put the report in our workroom so that the providers could interpret it and send it to medical records. I have that flowchart written out so that all parties are aware of the process and they have something to refer to. We're also logging the remote coaching sessions kind of as a way of, of keeping track of everybody that we're doing. And hopefully we'll be able to backtrack at some point and investigate the potential for ret retroactive billing, which our revenue integrity department says that as long as it's within certain time frames and that's different for each insurance. And then as reluctant as I was to involve our RT director, because I really wanted to have this project bundled up with a bow, because she, remember the go fish comment? Like, no, we're not investing our time and energy in this very time consuming and complicated project, I had to sit back down with her and say, I'm having a lot of issues and I need guidance. I need permission, I need guidance, where do I go from here? So I had to sit back down with her and she was actually very excited that we were using this and that we were doing this and she described this as the future. There's applications in other disease processes such as asthma and COPD she says, as hospital beds become tighter and hospital staffing become shorter, there's going to be more and more focus on telehealth and remote monitoring. So if we can build that foundation now and form, figure out the billing, then we're going to be ahead of the game by the time this really hits. So I was very pleasantly surprised by her reaction. So some of the lessons that I've learned along this way is that there has to be somebody in charge. There has to be a Donna and a Laura Beth at your center. There has to be an Andy at your center. There has to be a champion 
to keep the conversation going and to keep touching base with all of these different components and saying, how's it going? Are you seeing what you need to see? Are we doing what we need to be doing? What do we need to be doing differently? It's important to outline the process for everyone to reference. I don't know if you guys have heard the term the playbook. That's also a quality improvement term. But it's basically an outline that if I leave my job, whoever fills my space will be, have something to refer to. The PFT lab will also have something to refer to or whoever, whatever turnover happens in that area will have, the billing department will have something to refer to. So no matter how basic, it does seem very simple. I have to remind you to place an order. I have to remind you to document that you completed the order. I have to remind you that the results have to go to medical records. Even though that seems very basic, it was a good review for us all. And it can be very helpful. Follow-up is essential. Test the process regularly. Keep the conversation going and see what's working and what's not. Communicate to keep the process moving forward and talk regularly. Assess the needs. Hold people accountable and get ideas from other people. I feel like I'm decent at my job, but I don't have all the answers, and I don't have all of the ideas, especially when it comes to the billing experts in, in the Revenue Integrity Department. They are the experts at what they do. They see this com component. The PFT lab is experts in what they do. They see this component. The CF team, we're experts in what we do, but we only see this component. So you have to have a champion that can help put all of that together. And it's important to ask for other people's opinions or options. Some of our successes along the way is that the PFT lab now has the process down pat. I'm not gonna go into all of the IT problems and challenges because you've already heard some of that this morning, but they have really done a good job of working out the technical aspects for connecting. We have a running log created, good phone numbers, good emails that are successful in being able to contact our patients and our families. They have an Excel spreadsheet that has notes on this particular patient's ability to perform PFTs. So if their, their, their blast out has never been good, that is noted so that when they do the next remote coaching, they know exactly where to pinpoint. And they can say, oh, this is a repeated problem. Remember last time we worked on whatever. They also have a record of the best effort within the year, so if the patient blows, and let's say their FEV1 is 76, but their, their best, their baseline is say 98, then they know something's up and they can send a message to the provider in our portal. They also learned the best time to do remote coaching was more so in the afternoon after 4 p.m. So that's what, once kids are home from school, parents are back home, and on some occasions, it's not regular, but on some occasions, they actually adjusted their work hours to be available more in the later afternoon and evening. So instead of 8 to 5, they come in like maybe 9 to 6 or even 10 to 7 on some occasions. And our RT director is now in, despite that current lack of funding, she, that go fish mentality is, is not where she sits anymore. And many parents are reporting that they're practicing at home, and so the technique is improving, and the PFT lab is confirming that as well. I want to say thank you in particular to Deb and Bree, who are the two girls that are heading up the PFT remote coaching. They were the adult people who were like, sure, kids are no problem. But they've really adjusted, they've learned, they've remained positive, and they've done a fabulous job, and, and they haven't minded me coming into the lab and really diving deep into their process. Thank you. So I think we have time for one question, and uh, we'll take a verbal question. If anybody has any questions for Dabney, we'll take one. No? OK. <laughs> So out of all the patients that we have that have home spirometers, how many of them are doing valid? I, yes, I have, um, I have a, a Word document that I keep track of all of that, but I haven't sat down to actually calculate the percentages or anything. But we can say, like when, when a remote coaching session is scheduled, I'll touch base with the PFT lab and I'll say, you know, this one's 
had some trouble in the past, and then they'll pull them up and they'll go, oh yeah, I see, like she's done, she never takes a deep enough breath in, or she's a gentle little girl, she never really wants to punch it on the blast out. So we have communications with that, and we, we look at it in the moment, but I don't have like a percentage for you. Thank you, Dabney. So now we're gonna move on to our Last speaker, this is Debbie Benitez. Debbie has been a nurse practitioner and nurse coordinator for the adult cystic fibrosis team at the University of Southern California since 2003. Her role includes direct outpatient and inpatient care for more than 150 adult patients with CF, as well as program coordination of her interdisciplinary team. She is actively involved in committees for the CF Foundation, has been the nursing chair for NACFC since 2012, and she was also the recipient of the Mary M. Contos Care Champion Award in 2017. Welcome, Debbie. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm actually not going to repeat some of the many um, themes that have already been described, but I really wanted to... Um, let you know about our team's success with respect to billing and actual revenue generation. So that's uh, my focus today. Oh, I have to push down. This one? First one, hit here, and then you can use that from now on. This one? Yep. Okay. Okay, I don't have any disclosures, financial disclosures for this, related to this presentation. Uh, this is Mount Everest, and as you know, this was something brand new to everybody, so um, it really felt like climbing a mountain. Um, and as everyone resonated earlier, that this really was a journey um, no one was familiar with, uh, uncharted waters. And um, I always like to appreciate the CF Foundation jumping in like the superhero that it usually is and saving us, really, when we were going into telemedicine. So... As Dabney pointed out, yes, you absolutely need to have a champion. Um, and that really was uh, actually four of us, uh, two of our medical directors, myself, and also Mary, our respiratory therapist, because it did really require a lot of follow-up uh, with respect to checking in and making sure things were working. Um, obviously, we did opt in for the dashboard, and I, I will suggest that we always decided that we were going to do this because we thought that we absolutely needed to have uh, the PDF version of the testing. We needed to be able to get in and uh, reject uh, the poor tests and, and select the best test. Uh, if, it were, if we had no best tests, then RT was uh, very quick to contact them uh, to redo a setup or redo a training if that was necessary because we were all remote during that time in which this was implemented. Uh, we did not opt, uh, opt for the screenshot because we saw the quality of that when we had asked Zephyr to show us uh, and decided that that wasn't going to be what we wanted. And we decided that we were going to take that cost. We were not going to charge this to the person. We were not going to make it optional. And we wanted everyone's test to be viewable so that we could review it. Uh, so this is how you get into the dashboard. I just wanted you guys to take a look. Uh, it is secured. It does require um, a code that you would have to put in. So it is quite secure uh, for anyone that was leery of what it might look like. Uh, this is what our dashboard looks like when we go in. Uh, I actually go in daily and I look because a lot of times we have prompted people either after a visit or after initiation of a triage or after starting oral antibiotics or initiation of inhaled antibiotics or we sent them home on home IVs. We wanted to check quickly, be able to analyze and then be able to pivot in our treatment regimen if required. The other thing I wanted to show you is you absolutely can remove a person directly from the dashboard. And this is necessary because in the adult world, people move different states for different reasons. They go off to college or get a master's degree. So this is really great and important to note because if your patient transitions, you don't want to have to be billed for their dashboard monthly, uh, especially if your care center is paying for the usage. Uh, this is what uh, a view is for the provider. 
Uh, and as you can see here, I like to use the one-year view because we like to see what traditionally they've been doing. Uh, we also like to see how often they're using it, so this gives us a bird's eye view. We use this very often and we share this amongst our team members so we can understand uh, how often they're using it and also how it relates to their spirometry and clinic. So billing, so as many of, of us mentioned already, we did attend a Zephyr RX Medicare consultant webinar on billing and this happened in 2020. And really she gave really good specific information, uh, one of which was that it really could only be analyzed by a provider of record or a treating provider and APPs are included, but this depends on your state. So if you are an APP, you want to check under your state licensure if this is something that you're permissible to bill. It's also important that the recommendation for home spirometry be placed in your note before initiation of the home spirometry program pre-billing. So be sure to do that, and it needs to be in your subsequent follow-up note as well, because you're not going to know, like for our center, we don't know when we're going to use home spirometry, so we just have it automatically rolled into our recommendations for follow-up visits. It's also important to have an orderable, right? Like anything that we do, everything needs an order, and this is one of them, especially if you're going to bill. So please be sure to do that. And we were told that this order is good for one full year. You don't need to put it in every time, although I believe it's different in different institutions. It's Dabney's institution is using it. Uh, they're scheduling these remote coaching, so that's different. Uh, but we don't do that because all of our home spirometry is done and controlled by the care center. None of our home spirometers are uh, facilitated or reviewed or touched by our PFT lab. Everything is done within the care center. So it's up to your institution to decide uh, because we realize that the PFT lab already had a lot on their plate and loss of staff, uh, so we decided to take this on. We also knew right up front that we needed to put the results within the EMR, which is why the dashboard was the best choice for us, because it is that PDF form uh, that we could upload direct into the chart under a remote monitoring folder. These are the CPT codes that can be used and are billable and are Medicare approved and are reimbursed. Uh, the first one is the setup. So if you haven't started your program, this is the best code to start. It obviously generates the most revenue. My understanding is $140 uh, for this code. So if you're getting started, your RT certainly would do the setup. So this would be all that, that 45, 60 minute time that your RT is spending is billable. You don't need an APP or a provider. So an RT can bill this because this is basically a technical fee with education on use, getting them onto the dashboard so you can be reimbursed for the time. Now, if you are a hospital-based clinic or a standalone clinic, so it depends, you need to understand that at your center. My center is a hospital-based clinic. So we are unable to use what they call the parent code, which is the 94010, 94014. So instead, uh, because we're a hospital-based clinic, they separate the two codes, uh, which is 94015, which is the technical fee, Dabney had pointed that out, and 94016, which is the professional fee, which is the analysis of the home spirometer result. So yes, you absolutely need to have the right uh, stakeholders involved at the table when you make your decision to set up your program. Uh, the first person you want to talk to is your clinic business administrator. Um, so as you know, our revenue certainly was reduced from telemedicine, right? So we had to make that up. And we made this up through talking to our administrator saying, hey, this is a revenue opportunity. We're getting the devices free from the foundation. We need to get on this. And he was like, yeah, we need to do this. So he really bought in because he was really invested in making sure that we could make up uh, some of the, RV, R, the revenue that we had lost. Uh, he set us up to meet with the revenue integrity team. This is also what Dabney had pointed out. And really, they were the ones that investigated all these codes because we had them all from the Zephyr webinar. And they were the ones that actually looked for the reimbursement, made sure that it was going to be built out into the codes that we had already had made for our facility. 
Uh, they wanted to check all the insurance rules. So we literally went over all of our insurance plans with someone, um, and they basically told us, okay, these plans, they can do it. These plans, no. These, this you can only build within 40 days, within 90 days, within six months, so that you can really understand how quickly you need to pivot to get these billed and documented. So that's really important to have that person. Um, and they were also the ones that told us, you need to have a separate encounter. You absolutely cannot attach this to um, an in-person visit. So we said, great, we can do that, because we weren't necessarily always using them with a telemed visit. Now, if you're using it alongside a telemed visit, then you don't need to create a new encounter generation. So that's key. And then they connected us with the auditing team, because we wanted to make sure that as we set this up, that someone on the back end who's dropping the bill and then validating when plans would ask, well, where's this and where's that? That they knew exactly where it was going to be and they gave us directions on what needed to be in the chart, where it needed to be so they could pull it up quickly, and they trained their whole auditing team assigned to our pulmonary department to quickly be able to find these pieces so that we wouldn't get any rejections for revenue billing. And then obviously you certainly need to talk to your IT team we have someone assigned to pulmonary division, so that person was pretty uh, easy to get a hold of, and he was the one that helped us build all the key pieces within our EMR system. So right after we were able to get all the pieces together, we were also then talking about, okay, once uh, who's going to do what? What do we need to put in? Who's going to do that? So really we created a, a process, right? So we created a template a templated provider note for the initiation and the plan along with the orderable. And we made it so that anyone can place the order, so our RT can place the order, our nurses can place the order, the provider can place the order, did not need a co-signature. Uh, because we didn't want that to delay our ability to be able to do this test, get the results, and bill. Um, then we were able to do the education, which our respiratory therapist did, and she was able to bill the new initial setup uh, because our clinic was billing this, we created a, a log by month um, for each year, and we cr have the encounter number for each of these pre-made by our medical assistant. We had her trained because we wanted to keep everything in-house, um, and our RT would then um, delineate whether it was a new setup or if it was just coaching. So that would help assist in dropping the charge by that encounter. So then you can make sure that all those pieces are completed. And we have this in our MS teams. Uh, so we created a team simply for home spirometry. So now all the providers, the RT, the nurse, everyone can see it, including the MA. Um, and then all of this is then everyone knows who owns what. So our RT is in charge of, of uh, rejecting the tests. Uh, I'm printing it out and making sure it gets uploaded into the correct fin because you need to match that the bill that you're dropping matches the fin that's attached with the results because that was, that was a whole new thing that we had to learn. And then making sure that whoever was analyzing it was also using that fin so that everything was umbrellaed under the same code and so there would be no issues with billing. Uh, this is what our EMR orderable uh, is in our EMR, it's called Remote Home Spirometry CF. We wanted to delineate this because we knew that possibly other pulmonary service lines might use this. I know our ALS team is using this now as well, so um, it was important that we created the CF at the end. Uh, so this is what the PDF uh, looks like. Again, I just wanted to show this. This is for a one individual test. This is after we had thrown out or rejected a test. Uh, so this is what something that we get uploaded into the EMR. This is what our RT's documentation looks like. And this is um, placed after the initial setup. Um, she basically also does the, their very first test with them uh, so she can show them um, how to do it and also to show them success and talks to them about their comparative against the clinic's spirometry. Uh, this is our note uh, after analysis for, um, res uh, for HS testing. So if you want to take a picture of that. <laughs> it is very similar to Laura's, so uh, very, um, you can make them all smart phrases. This doesn't have to be 
recreated every time. Uh, but I did want to point out that one caveat is if you have managed care plans, so these are like commercial HMO or managed Medicaid, which um, some states who have Medicaid plans have carve-outs for these, these are exempted. We do not bill these because these require authorizations, right? And authorizations means you need to know preemptively when you're going to do it. Well, that's not possible, right? Because you don't know when someone's going to be ill, you don't know when you're adding on a telemed visit, so it's or you don't know when someone's going home, so you can't pre-plan. And most HMOs take anywhere from 10 to 14 days to turn around to respond, unless you mark it urgent. So depending on the use of this test, you can consider submitting those HMO requests. So we decided we were going to eat those costs. I will say that less than 5% of our patients are HMO, so that is important. Uh, to, to, to let you know, and yes, we are still paying for their dashboard cost. So this is a loss uh, to our center for any HMO or managed care plan who might be using their HS device. And again, it's quite tedious if they get denied uh, because you will need to appeal that, and a lot of the onus is back on the providers for us to write medical necessity letters or do a peer-to-peer -peer and justify the use, which obviously can be done. We've not done it. We've opted not to do it because we wanted to move quickly to be able to um, get as many of our patients billed that were possible. And because we had a small N of HMO and or managed care plans, we decided we we're just going to eat that cost. So this is our revenue. So this is the most important side, obviously, that I want to point out, which is presently we have 155 people uh, that have been issued or dispensed a HS device. Presently, or I should say in 2021, we only, only, <laughs> billed for 144 uh, of those uh, 155. Those are the non-managed plan people. So um, for those of you who were unaware, the dashboard was free was free from January 2021 until June of 2021. So we wanted to move quickly and implemented billing in February of 2021. Um, and when we did that, as you can see here, our 94015, which is the technical fee, which is the facility fee, which is what the hospital charges, uh, we collected $61,307.20. That's a pretty good chunk. Um, the prof fee, which is the analysis, uh, which would be tied to the recommendations, did not necessarily equate to much. It was only $318. It's quite minimal. We were quite disappointed. Uh, but nonetheless, the data was necessary for clinical care, and there was certainly a lot of changes to medical management and or improvement or response therapy, so it, it was still beneficial for use. So in total after dashboard costs, because we do pay for this, we are billed monthly by Zephyr RX, uh, we paid a total of $4,230 from that July to December, which is in the red. And so we did make a total of $61,625. So as you can see, this is quite uh, generous with respect to you know, loss of in-clinic spirometry that you didn't get when, you all, when we pivoted right to telemedicine. Um, and this is something, obviously, that we wanted to be able to do to also continue to support some of the care team members within our care center. Um, and then in 2022, because we can only show you, obviously, for the last six months, uh, that we have pretty much made approximately 42857 to date, but we're projecting that we'll uh, get up to 85000 based on what we are presently seeing with our dashboard cost. Uh, and the average use of the spirometry by month. I do want to pro, uh, point out the fact that um, there are 51 care centers who are currently prescribed on the dashboard, uh, and this was new data I got from Zephyr RX before this conference because I wanted uh, to you guys to see, based off of what Greg had pointed out, who wasn't on the dashboard versus uh, who was. So um, I'm encouraging all of you to get on the dashboard and, and consider to get some of this revenue. So lessons learned, um, obviously you want to stick to your care center's mission, and that really was to continuously provide that high-quality care 
And we really couldn't do that in the telemedicine platform without spirometry. Uh, and I thought it was quite important for us to have it because there, at the time there still wasn't a vaccine in 2020. Uh, and um, so we really wanted to get most of these people on and be able to see if they were in fact having symptoms of COVID. And we wanted to make sure we could see that quickly. You really need an adult partner because we learned quickly that, yeah, we're not doing it every month. No way, uh, even though that was something we had discussed that we had hoped they could do. Uh, but they brought up a good point, right? They said, we only do it four times a year. Why would we have to do it once a month? Uh, so, you know, we explained to them that I think it really was for the purpose of them being familiar with the device. Because we did notice that those who weren't using it at least monthly would say, you know, I kind of forgot how to use that. I need to call Mary and have her retrain. And as you heard, it does take an, a large amount of time for the RTs. So um, hopefully, if they can get to use it monthly, it's really more for them to become stay familiar with the device and the technique for use. Um, really have to speak the language also to your business administrator, right? Money talks. They, it's true. I, it sounds ridiculous because we're in the business of of CF, which is all about you know partnerships and caring. Yes, that's all important, but that doesn't speak to how do we get this bill in here? How do we make this additional revenue so we can continue to have the care team that's most important, especially if you're in the adult world and most of your patients, I know ours, would prefer telemed. Because as we all heard, it's, it's a distance to clinic. They have jobs now. Some of them are going back to school to get degrees that they never thought they needed to get. So life is different, and remote monitoring is here to stay. Telemedicine is here to stay. So I'm encouraging you to be able to start having these conversations with your clinic business person. And then be sure that somebody's monitoring your dashboard regularly because you want to remove people who have transitioned away, people who have moved. That's important because if you're absorbing the cost and are paying for it, then you want to make sure that you're only paying for the ones that you are obviously managing um, at your care center. Future needs. I do want to say that the lifespan of this device is only for five years. We're, we're already in year two. <laughs> so we need to start planning ahead. And I've already had many people tell us that they have lost their device. You know, I think it was in my trunk. I moved since I got it. I don't know where it is. Um, and so, you know, reminding them, once you get it, don't lose it. I mean, I oversight, right? You, we didn't think that that should probably be in a very important part of the instruction, uh, is keep it somewhere where, you're, where you can see it um, and make sure you obviously clean and disinfect it. So um, that's something right now that we're thinking about. I did contact Zephyr to find out what's the plan because the foundation um, set up a bundle program for the CF community. So presently, if you were a new service line and wanted to get uh, a device, you would be paying $145, but it would not be a subscription to the dashboard. The CF Foundation created a bundle contract with Zephyr RX and purchased whatever was needed per care center, but got it for $145 that included the dashboard. So if you started today without getting the subscription, initially with the dispensing, you will need to now pay for the dashboard. So. This is important, um, and make sure you clarify that when you reach out to Zephyr RX if you have not initiated and have not yet dispensed devices. I also asked about people who have lost devices, so um, because we have had a few, and I said, do we, do we get a discount because we have a contract through the foundation, and we started this when initially it was um, started, and they said, you do. So this is new, so this is late breaking, um, it is $99 for someone to replace their home spirometry if they were a, a previous user, meaning they were on the dashboard, but now they've lost it or have had used the device at least once uh, within the time that they had it dispensed. And you can do this by putting in an order, then filling out a form through the Zephyr RX website, and then sending that in, and then the invoice gets either sent to the patient, so you have to decide, either the invoice gets sent to the patient, the patient pays the $99, or the invoice gets sent to the care team, 
and the care team decides to eat that and pay that cost of $99. And then they will auto, you can, you can either opt to have it mailed direct to the person or you can have it directly mailed to the care center. And I think we heard lessons learned. It's probably best to have it at the care center and then do the in-person training. Uh, so you might want to decide to do that as well. I also want to point out that in 2022, um, there are these new RTM codes that just came out. We, I finally just explored them further, and we're actually going to start doing this uh, relatively soon. Um, and basically, these new codes, this 92980 and 92981, are additional revenue opportunities for a clinical member of the care team who's providing instruction or recommendation on therapies can bill. So this includes a nurse. I specified this. A nurse, a respiratory therapist, as long as they have discussed it with a provider. So for instance, if your provider says, Dabney, I'm using her because she was the speaker in front of me. Dabney, I reviewed um, Laura's spirometry and it's down you know, get, him, get her to do it again in the three days, and if it's still down, then let's get antibiotics, and then let's see if she doesn't respond in seven days, and we'll need to admit. This is just a hypothetical scenario. Dabney could then document. I called the patient. I dis we discussed it with the provider. The instruction is for her to increase her airway clearance, repeat the test in three days, uh, start the oral antibiotics, that we would follow it up to see her response, and if there was no improvement, that the plan would be to admit. that. And that was a 20-minute, so this is, could be by phone. It did not need to be a virtual visit. You could create an encounter, and you could build this. So. Uh, this is something that we're going to be doing uh, relatively soon and hopefully can share with you guys next year with whether or not that will uptick our revenue opportunity. So uh, there is also another code. So this additional 20 minutes is if Dabney calls Laura back in seven days after she repeats her HS. And we say to Dabney, Dabney, it's great. The PFTs are trending up. Stay on the oral antibiotics. Repeat the test at the end of the 10-day course. Continue the um, increased airway clearance, right? Continue to monitor your blood sugars if they were diabetic. Right? So all those things, if an additional time on top of the original time for therapeutic monitoring was provided, you can drop another bill for that additional patient instruction of therapeutic monitoring uh, then you can also build that. So lots of opportunities here. Uh, I would strongly suggest you don't blow it and you really try to work with your care center to make it happen uh, because I think this is a really great time to be able to get every center on track with this. Um, we're also working with our um, integrity team, revenue integrity team, to figure out what we're going to do about our managed care plan patients because we need to find a way to be able to bill for them I think the biggest um, barrier at the moment is for them to get bills. So we already heard from other care centers that people would get bills and this would actually lure them away from either maybe perhaps even performing the HS or having them come off the dashboard. Um, so I guess your care center would need to make that decision what's ideal for your uh, patient population and how it is that you want to manage those, them. Um, I also... We are looking to also see if some of this revenue over time can support a dedicated FTE because, as you have heard, this is a lot of people involved in one singular program, and, and it would be nice to have someone just take it all over uh, to be able to monitor and continue to stay up to date with changes even within reimbursement, right? Every year it's different. So just putting it out there that you should be familiar with your key stakeholders and, and continue to stay in touch. I just want to thank my team because it does take a village um, to do the work. So uh, partner up. And I'll be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. So actually, I think we're at time. So if you have a question, feel free to, to come up. But thank you so much, Debbie. And to all our speakers, thank you for all of you for coming out today. And don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Have a great day. So sorry. I tried to Thank <laughs> you.